Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. We are joined by Paula Howell here, getting on the cynical side of things. I guess I could introduce you that way. How are you doing, darling? (laughs) I'm good. I'm good. It's been a bit of a roller coaster ride the last couple of weeks with admissions and deadlines and parental expectations, Mm -hmm. realistic, some realistic, some unrealistic. And I think today's a great segue to kind of have that conversation and lean into the idea of expectation. Oh, and by the way, she's the uh, owner and educational counselor at Howell Academics. That's Howell, H-O-W-E-L-L, academics.com. So before we get down that path, tell us a little bit about what it is you do, who it is you help, and a little about your journey. I know you've been very busy. (laughs) Yes, well, I'm an education consultant, and I have been um, formally at uh, Howell Academics as my firm uh, that I launched a little bit under 2013, and we help families focus on educational Uh, I guess their education journey and beyond, I'd like to say. And with that, I think it encompasses a lot more than just education because being able to script or design who your family is in the lens of your child um, is is quite a feat. And with that, it comes with many different parts and pieces. Uh Well, thank you for sharing. And uh, I know you've been busy, like you said, admission season, academic season. This is like the time. So fill us in on what's happening. And I can't wait to hear the, uh, uh, what did you say? (laughs) Cynical side. Yeah. (laughs) I think think there's a different lens. And I think that's an important side. I Mm -hmm. I, want to play it on the idea of uh, kind of give it in a metaphoric kind of, if I can paint the picture, so to speak. So I want to paint the picture of you are a private school. And you have a very limited amount of space that you have available for yourself and for the students to come. Mm -hmm. And you open up an open house to allow parents to come and learn more about your school. But during that open house, there are parents who want to monopolize time. There are parents who want to stand out and consider this time to be the time that they are able to plug or push their child and family. There's an idea that this is the time and place to do that. And there's also the idea of why is it not the time and place to do that, right? I'm painting that picture because it kind of encompasses the idea of what sometimes the idea of having more or having or not having becomes a divide. And I'm going to make that a bit clear. Sure. So a lot of times I'll have parents who will say to me, you know, we're applying to private school. We want to get into the school. We think we're the best family for the school. Why didn't we get into the school? Mm-hmm. Or, you know, what is it that we need you for to help us get into school? Because we're amazing in a nutshell. Okay. And then they don't get in and then they come back the next year and they say to me, well, we do need you. So we're going to go with that process. Right. Because they thought they could feed it on their own. Yeah. And then what you discover is, is that there needs to be a sense of humility for parents and people who are applying to private school. And the challenge is, is that private school is like anything, an institution filled with people who are then employees and workers within that institution. Yeah. And the challenge is, is that most who work within the institution of education, whether it be private or whether it be public, are everyday people who navigate the world every day. Yep. And there's a notion or idea that because there is a payment or there's a transaction, that somehow the class differentiation of I have means I get. And there's that distinction that needs to be kind of removed Mm -hmm. and understood that we are still working within the frame Uh, of our everyday citizen. Got it. Good one. Yeah. Yeah. So when I say today it's a bit more of a cynical day, I think it's more of a day of enlightenment because um, I think what's most important is is that where where and how do we navigate this world of admissions while still keeping a humble lens and also understanding what the true nature of why we're doing things is, right? So I pose the question because what happens is traditionally around this time of year, Parents go on fire, I would say. Parents' expectations go beyond a narrative that's even realistic, oh, right? No. And the demands are very high. And I believe that a lot of it comes down to an internal compass of wanting to fit in, be accepted, or even as much as a demand for worth and value 
is indicative of the outcome of this process. And really, a blind side is left to why you're doing the process. Okay. Right? And then you also are able to see why those who are successful in the process are successful and then why those who are not successful in the process are not. So let's flip it. Pretend you have a decision and decide to say to yourself, I want to get in shape. I want to hit my, you know, my 50s hot and fabulous. Mm -hmm. And you say, I'm going to get a personal trainer. Okay, I'm going to get the best personal trainer I possibly can. I'm going to, you know, buy all this state of the art equipment because I have all the resources to buy. Mm -hmm. Every single thing, right? I'm going to even get a chef to cook the food. Yet the plan is set out for you. Everything is there. You have all the resource, all the access. Yet you consistently do drive throughs through the fast food area you polish the equipment but use it to hang your clothing wow yeah you're good you Mm -hmm. then end up taking the strategy rewriting it to fit a narrative that you want and after about six months you ask yourself why was i not successful and you want then to blame the resource or you want to blame the equipment or you want to blame the strategy or you want to blame the process without taking ownership of understanding that you didn't let go of your own need for control. And the accountability factor. Exactly, yeah. Paula. Yep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I bring it back to admissions because it is so indicative of that idea of because I can, I should be allowed. And that is not how it works because the people that are within the institution, a private school entity, whether it be me, whether it be a person who works in the school, whether it even be the head of school, they what they had to do to get to that stage within their framework of what they had mm-hmm. encompassed many different struggles, many different hurdles, many different challenges, and also many triumphs. But within that, they have to look at all of that within the family before they decide that they want them within their community that they can choose. Because if a parent just comes to you with this idea of worth and expectation and demand, void of being able to be reflective of their own adversities, the admissions coordination team resource treadmill, so to speak, can see that you're not willing to do the work to plug in. So there's no point for them even to spend time when they have a plethora of people that they can choose from. So the quest or question of what do I do? Owl Academics is an education consulting firm that helps families plan their journey of academics. But it's academics and beyond because the idea is, is that academics are just the framework of how we condition ourselves, understand ourselves, find our way through the world. So unless you're willing to actually take off your glasses, so to speak, and actually see the world through a lens that isn't the rose one that you want to filter it through, then you aren't going to achieve what you want to achieve. And I, I, I come to it today because the, uh, the notion of expectation of people and demand of people is within the lens and framework of what they want, not considering the idea of others at times, right? So I, I ask you this question as, as a mother, as a, as a businesswoman, as a person, as you, right? Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts regarding your experience with, uh, with, I would say hierarchy of of like the way our world is structured with like class, with accessibility, with access. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, accountability, what is your, well, I have, I have a a kind of an example in my head that I'm thinking what happened was uh, my son is uh, nine and seven. My Mm -hmm. nine-year-old was in uh, enrolled in pre-K right? And uh, when he was, I, you know, I get a letter sent home after a few weeks that, you know, we think your son needs special, you know, special services. And I'm like, "Ah, you panic. No, my son doesn't. No, he does not. No, 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 no. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what did I miss? What did, and my sister works as an aide in a special education class. I'm like, Jen, oh my goodness. So it turns out like, and I talked to the teacher, well, he doesn't have the fine motor skills to pick up the pencil. He doesn't have, he can't cut. And I'm like, what? She's like, he doesn't know I'm like, you know what? I said, I never, I said, I never tried writing with him. I didn't think I'd start writing with him at three or four, whatever. I said, I'm too busy working. Should, I should have wrote with him. I never thought, like I never, oh my God, it's my fault. So, but then I'm like, oh my gosh. So then we had to go. So at first it was not my son. 
right? No one wants to say it's me or I have a problem or my child has a problem. You get defensive. And um, then we had to go to a special school for an evaluation. He had to go to a psychologist. He had to go to, Mm -hmm. um, you probably aware of these types of procedures. I Mm -hmm. wasn't. Um, Then he had to meet with the physical therapist to check everything out. Lo and behold, by the time we got the second meeting with the teacher and the school district was like Mm -hmm. three months later. And the teacher comes to me and says, I'm so sorry. I was wrong. She's like, huh. it just was that your son was never really used a scissor. You, like you said, you never he never used a pencil. He's gained the skills that he needed. But again, inst- and I would I never questioned the teacher like not my son. I was very respectful behind the scenes. I did right. I felt like, oh. yeah. but I, but I was you know glad for my turnout in a sense. But there's some people. Same thing happened to another child, and the parent went ballistic on the teacher. And and that's not how it should be, but I know sometimes parents do that. It's like you have to respect what they say and take accountability, breathe, go through the process. And, okay, Okay. let's see if he does need that special help. And go through the the, the PT, go through the psychologist. Go Even though you felt like it wasn't the right thing, you got to do it, right? But Mm -hmm. I've seen how other parents behave in that situation and not nice to the teacher. It's not that that's the poor teacher just doing her job, relaying her skills and her, you know, someone who's working in your office, they're just there because that's their mindset and skills. But sometimes people take it out on the wrong people, right? Like mm-hmm. if my son should be in this school and this is why, and then the inner workings, well, maybe he's not as qualified as you think or not as, so yeah. I'm relating in that sense for sure. And I've seen yeah. parents handle things differently instead of being open and yeah, rightfully upset because you miss something or you you didn't see it. You got to calm it down and understand the professionals have a job to do. And that's why she did what she did. And in the end, I looked out in a sense where it was just, he didn't have the practice. He never did it before. So yes. to her in the beginning, wow, he didn't know what he was doing. So immediately mm-hmm. she thought he had a, a, um, an issue yeah. or a problem and an, an ability or a disability, you know, and I'm, so yeah. I get it. And I could only imagine. Yeah, I think that's an excellent story. Like I, there's so many pieces in there that are so relevant um, that make the story excellent because there was one, there was a teacher who was like, you know, really assessing and looking at a matrix. And I always say it's difficult because in any professional entity, we always just use what we call statistics by yeah. the age of so-and-so a child should be doing this. Exactly. And they need to keep within that framework. Mm-hmm. I understand the framework necessity because you need a, you need a level of playing field to understand how do you measure. Yeah. So in the measurement, of course, your emotion and your feelings of feeling inadequate are only natural. Mm-hmm. However, you didn't allow yourself to react in the center of saying, this is a teacher that I've entrusted my son to and her intention I can recognize is not in a negative form. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to not react to her emotion. Rather, I'm going to pause the reaction to her because it's not directed to her take it home and scream and yell and do my thing and feel all my emotions. Yes. But go through the emotions because the best interest is put into play. Yes. It's about my Mm -hmm. child. And if Mm -hmm. he did need help, he's in the right spot. We're going down the right steps. So you always, at first, that overreactionary sense, which I think we all have and all get, right? And then it becomes... Wow. Okay. There, you know, this is, this is the reason why this is happening. This is important. This is, there is an issue with the statistics. That's not right. He's not statistically where he should be. And it's not her fault. This is how she's trained. Don't take it out on the teacher, but yeah. Mm -hmm. And then that's the part. So the lens that's different is, is that in my role of what I do at Howell Academics, I also deal with the reactive part. So the challenge is, is that I not only shoulder the formality, the experience, the consult, the statistics. I also deal with the reactive. And the challenge with that is to try to create a segue between parents to understand where you found that calm and go, how do I show up? How do I show up? And what am I actually mirroring back to those who are the ones that are the decision makers? Mm -hmm. So now take the same situation. You're in this school. You're there. But let's pretend you're not. And you get there and you have the assessment. And the parent is kind of standing blown up with the idea of my child is perfect. Yet Billy or Bobby doesn't want to go into the class for assessment. Mm -hmm. And Billy and Bobby just says to himself, I don't want to do this. Mm -hmm. And the parent becomes reactive. But a reactive that appears passive. Like, oh, you want to do it, darling. Of course you do. 
The idea is, is that they think they're eluding what the school wants them to do. When I would suggest, how would you have reacted at home when your son felt that way? Would you have encouraged him to go? Would you have just said, of course you can do it? Or would you have said, mm-hmm. it's okay, you need a few minutes? Or would you have talked to the person and said, I need a few minutes? And they say, well, we can't do that. No. And I say, you can. Because the people that are there are no different than you and I. And if you understand how you can authenticate your reaction, yeah. you can get action that you want. But there has to be that space to be open, to jump back on the treadmill, to walk away, to yep. listen, to read, to do all of that. So mm-hmm. when I say this is a, this is a, this is the time of year that always triggers me to learn something new for myself. Okay. Yep. Like I can say like there was one year going through my own personal things. I decided to take mediation, right? Conflict resolution, right? Family law. There was then, you know, you move into listening to people's stories all the time. So I decided to train to life coaching, work through that process. And then there was a part of, you know, thinking about, uh, you know, uh, human behavior and resource. And then it's thinking of, you know, getting the, the HR kind of understanding. And then ultimately it came down to it all is the matrix of the mind. And that's the masters of, edu- of clinical counseling. But I think what's interesting the most is that the, the parameter of what you said in your story is exactly, you could write a novel about it because there are so many pieces within that frame mm-hmm. that ultimately encompass the outcome of private school admissions. Yeah. That if people were just able to look at your scissor story as simply the idea that it is not whether you had a zillion dollars or five dollars. It's not whether you came yeah. from the best school or the worst school. It's not whether you were a single home or, I don't know, like a home with like whatever. Now there's apparently 30 different ways you can have a home. Okay. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, it really comes down to what are you observing, seeing and feeling? Are you allowing the resources in to support you? And are you doing it with an open mind, open heart for the best interests of your child who is still very new in this process? And the idea of scissors is no different than someone who's never driven a car. Beautiful. Yeah. Yep. So thank you. That was an excellent example. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, because I'm also, um, you know, I also think about this and help me out if this relates in any sense, but I forget the name, but that celebrity um, who uh, the actress and her husband, the designer who mm-hmm. paid a lot of money to get their child into a college. And then they, Oh, I remember the controversy. The name is below me too. Oh, wasn't she in the, like nine hundred two hundred? I, I want to full say that. house or something. Full house, but, one of those. Yes, I, I don't remember. But anyway, but she, she, you know, obviously had the money, and you know, some people think that they have the money. Their kid could do anything, and I'm sure there's a lot of that in this private school business too, right? Because a lot of oh, parents, a lot of a lot yeah, of they feel entitled. I have the money, um, and uh, this is what I want, and this is what I expect, and it's not what do I need or my child mm-hmm. needs. What suits him mm-hmm. or her best. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, is that ultimately it comes out in the wash. And that's what I realize and what I see is that ultimately you can have the money and maybe you get in because of the money. But remember, the, the title and the status aren't what going to, are going to move your child into future success. Mm-hmm. It's the narrative. It's the connection. It's the authenticity of what you do that will really strive and drive your child for a growth mindset, resilience, autonomy, the idea of integrity, compassion. Right. All of those things are roots and seeds that the school is just there in foundation. Hence why they're so strict in the process, because if they notice that out of the system of people who want to apply, that those seeds are actually not being filtered in all authenticity, they're not going to poison their garden Mm -hmm. of their school or they're trying at best to make it that way. So it's such an interesting uh, paradigm that I can discuss in in complete essence because there's so many parts and pieces and that's why I say your story is just so symbolic of just that process like where's your son today right I'm sure he's what is he doing today like if we look at scissors and art oh my gosh he's amazing he's in ninth grade he's excelling in math he's doing great fine yes is his penmanship a little sloppy yes as a mother I yell at him because the seven-year-old is better but Yeah. uh, yeah yeah we all have our falls our strengths our weaknesses yes yeah we all do and that's that's the core of the crux of it right is that we all have them and if we look at it as the interconnectedness of and not just big fancy words right and we actually look at that we are all interconnected yeah right no matter what 
level of hierarchy we feel that we have or earned and we let it go and present ourselves in that way, anything is achievable no matter what level you are. I, I like So I'll close with this is I had a client who called me um, earlier uh, this week and she had said to me, um, I can't believe it. I just found out that uh, a long friend that I hadn't talked to for a very long time, their child goes to this school that I'm trying to go to. And I said, well, I hear a lot of tension in your voice. Uh-huh. And she said, yeah, well, I'm really, I'm kind of distraught because I don't know why I'm investing so much in the process when they don't do any philanthropy. They have never, ever done any like extra tutoring or work. They, I know that they're not, you know, affluent by any means and yep. they, they aren't part of things. There was a list of things that this person went through about how this person is not worthy in essence of this position that she's trying so hard. And she had come to me after applying on her own independently and maybe using another firm. You never know. They won't share always with you. And she's going through this list. And all I heard was her own insecurities of value worth. And that yeah. at the end of the day, the difference between her and the other person was that they knew their worth was not encompassed by their status and all they had. Yes. And she, or he, I'll say for just protection purposes, is still trying to validate their worth and understanding by the status and the use of their child's expectation of success to validate it. And a school will never accept that. So what I'm saying is, is that there is a code that is still prevalent, that is still there. And it's when we understand the code of human behavior that the sky's the limit on what we can succeed. Beautiful. Wow. Thank you. We still have more minutes to talk, but that's great. Great yeah. conversation. Wow. Yeah. Ooh. Mm-hmm. So yeah. So it's like, you know, it's, it is what it is. So what are you starting up for Christmas? Let's change the lens, make it a bit poppy. Um, I think ultimately I, I counted down my daughters on reading week this week. I had to, I didn't even have to clean. I cleaned a little bit of today, but if you actually look on the floor of my office, uh, she Disaster. came yesterday as my little uh-huh. helper and that's, disaster zone um it was it was a disaster between sparkles and sparkles paint glue but mixed within mommy oh i know what i'll tell you it's the perfect thing within all of that mess and disaster so last week my daughter had you know the book fair at school wait so do we scholastic do you use scholastic book fair. yes scholastic must be- I yeah. did the okay. ePay option for the first time. <laughs> yeah. I want to. I want to hear your story. I got a story too. Okay. Go ahead. This made me melt. So my daughter had this scholastic meeting, and I. My daughter comes to work with me since she was like a kid, like a baby, practically mm-hmm. coming to my office, and she's always forever been artsy and trying and doing her best. And the odd time she'll she'll read books to the kids or do different things that will kind of just wow you, right? And go, you know, you just you do have this academic side and wanting to do things with without me having to actually share with you. Then. I always tend to always have that narrative that I still have to encourage her to read and do things like that. Okay. So it's a classic book fair and we had started doing jobs within the house to teach her about ownership of taking care of things and how things work in a system. So she saved, it accumulated a $35 over the last couple of weeks of all of her 25 cents for picking this up, doing this thing. Uh-huh. And she goes to classic. I go, so Pedro, are you sure you're going to take all of your money to the fair? Yes, mommy. Yes, mommy. Yes, mommy. And I'm like, really, Paige, are you sure? She goes, yes, mommy. I worked really hard for my money and I'm going to do it. And I said, Paige, you really? Okay, it's up to you because I told you it's yours. So she gets to the fair and I get a text in the middle of my day. And the text from the librarian, and I, I wish I could find it right now for you with my time, says, Miss um, Howell, I just wanted to confirm, Paige has purchased how to teach printing to preschoolers and magnets for Howell Academics, because she says her mama works really hard and she wanted to show her mom that she knew that she did oh. too and that she wants to teach a class at your class. And I broke down crying. Oh and my I, God, that's beautiful. I was like, and it was $32.50. So she said she wasn't sure if she could spend, if she, if she had permission to spend her money on something like this. And she said she went, Paige walked into the the Scholastic and went right down to the teacher aisle and bought something and said that my mommy works really hard and I want to work hard like mommy. So I'm going to go to class. I'm going to do this activity. So I'm going to buy this for her. And I melted. I had mixed messages. Oh my gosh. I had had these ideas on how often I've been trying to teach those lessons of 
you know, and see, it's all a dollar, a dollar is time. A dollar is a minute of time. Beautiful. Like, 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 you know, I try to explain to her oh. that it's not about money. It's about the fact that we exchange money for our time. Yeah. And how I want a collector of time with you. Oh my God. It's about like the idea that I constantly sometimes wonder in my mind if she's showing up and understanding. Yeah. And work she clearly and is. That's is. great. And oh, then you have these magic moments, right? That, yeah. that kind of anchor. Melt for your you. heart. So, yeah. So you have time to hear your story because I know equally. Oh, my story is just quick. It's funny because I did the ePay system for the first time, which I've never done because I didn't oh, have cash on yes. me. But anyway, so I put sixty dollars in the account because my other son had was going the next day. Yes. My son comes home. He spent this whole sixty dollars, and he <laughs> he has all the books. Oh God, he's yes. got yeah, he's got a poster. He's got this. He's got like a, a, a he likes the digging of like the gems. He's seven, and I'm just yes. like, wait, Mike, but you supposed to spend only half? He's like. Oh, I thought I could spend it all. Just a cute story. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy, right? <laughs> it's crazy. Like I like we could go on forever with these. Like I think Scholastic's rubbing it in though, because like I didn't know Scholastic all the way out in your hood. It's like, yeah, like it automatically is. too the same day. That must have been a very But big it's day. good. It buys back the yes. books for the school and stuff too. So all right. Well, well unfortunately we're out of time. I, I so do I. I'm so glad. Yeah. I'm glad yeah. they're there. Well, thank you so much. Always a pleasure speaking with you. Always a remind we'll remind me how we contact week. you. Uh, so, yeah, so if you would like to get kind of the realistic lowdown on admissions, expectation, human behavior with it, contact Howell Academics, um, howellacademics.com. Beautiful. Thanks so awesome. much. Always Have a, a pleasure, weekend. sweetheart. You too. Okay, you Bye-bye. Too. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. They'll challenge your authority. They'll try to break your will. They'll push you to the edge of your sanity. Because that's what kids do. But this car is your territory, not theirs. Defend it. Who makes the payments? Who cleans it? Who drives it? You do. That's who. And in here, your word is law. So when you say you won't move until everyone's buckled up, you won't budge an inch until you hear that click. Never give up until they buckle up. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. For more information, visit safercar.gov slash kidsbuckleup.